I've, I've worked on this issue for nearly 20 years. In fact, next year, 2016, will be the 20th anniversary of when I launched an effort in 1996 to host the North Korean defectors, the first to ever speak out uh, publicly in the United States. But I also want to hear from you and answer your questions. So my plan is to first speak why I have claimed for nearly two decades that North Korea is the worst greatest, world's worst and greatest human rights tragedy. What changes have occurred in recent years that give me hope and what we should be doing to respond to this crisis. I will talk both about what individuals like you and me can do, but also what our governments should do to help the people of North Korea. But first I want to put Korea in perspective. The, the divide between South and North Korea is part of a global conflict that is happening around the world regarding the fundamental meaning of humanity, the value of human life. On the one side, you have people who believe that we're born with God-given rights, that each life has value and meaning, and everyone has the right to pursue their dreams simply because they're human beings. On the other side of this global battle, you have people who have no regard for human life. They see human life as something meant to serve an ideology, a regime, or even a person. There is no dignity, and there's no dignity or worth in mankind, and most assuredly no dignity or worth in womankind or even childhood. In ideologies which ascribe this latter view, you see a 14-year-old girl like Malayla Yousasi shot for advocating that girls should be able to go to school, as happened in Pakistan in 2012. In regimes which ascribe this view, bombs are strapped on children and grandmothers to use as suicide bombers, as we've seen in Iraq. You see desperate families fleeing the Islamic State in Syria, commonly known as ISIS, which epitomizes an ideology with no regard for human life or dignity. We see the atrocities that ISIS has committed, causing so many to flee their homelands and become refugees. Certainly the photo of the young three-year-old boy who drowned while fleeing Syria has made us all of, uh, of us more aware of this humanitarian tragedy. Whether it's radical Islam or ideolo ideologies like ISIS, whether it's communism, Nazism, or Kim Jong-unism as they have in North Korea, all of these ideologies have a common theme. Individual life has little value or meaning. The Korean Peninsula is a vivid illustration of this worldwide conflict. It's a country that's divided, that is a land of darkness and enormous suffering in the north where people are literally enslaved and isolated by a dictator. And in the south, a vibrant democracy that is full of light and hope and is known for sharing that light and hope with the rest of the world. In fact, South Korea is very engaged in many humanitarian programs all over the world and after the United States sends out more missionaries than any other country in the world. So I want to show this first uh, PowerPoint. This photo, this first photo, is a satellite photo, number one, sorry. This is number one. This photo is a satellite view of the Korean Peninsula at night. It really shows how far behind North Korea is compared to South Korea. The dark area that appears to be an expansive ocean, but is in fact where 23 million are suffering today under a most brutal dictatorship. Now, in my opinion, North Korea is the worst human rights tragedy occurring in the world today, and I want to give you some very specific reasons why I make that statement. That statement is not, not meant to take away from the significance of the very serious, tragic events we see in the news about events that are happening in the news all over the world every day. It's simply that this crisis has been going on for decades, and adding to this tragedy is the lack of attention to the human rights crisis and the fact that ending this crisis is indeed within our grasp. It is a fact that North Korea is the only country in the world that does not allow a single human right as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is a tragic irony that this document was passed in 1948 by the UN in reaction to the atrocities 
committed by Nazi Germany in Imperial Japan during World War II. 1948 is the same year Kim Il-sung, the current dictator's grandfather, came to power to ensure that North Koreans would not enjoy a single one of these human rights. North Koreans do not have the right to live where they want to live, to go to school where they want to attend school, to choose their professions, or even their spouses. They do not have the right to travel, freedom of movement, or even to have access to information beyond the regime's propaganda. Listening to a foreign radio broadcast can result in you and your family being sent to a political prison camp. In fact, any sign of discontent or disloyalty to the regime and you and your family up to three generations can be sent to a political prison camp. One of the first defectors I hosted in the United States back in 1998 and 1999 was Kang Chao Han, who was sent to a political prison camp with his family when he was eight years old because his grandfather had complained about the Kim regime. Here is something else that makes North Korea unique in its cruelty. The North Korea political prison camps have existed, have been existed ten times longer than the Nazi death camps, three times longer than the Soviet Gulag, and it existed even longer than the Chinese Lava. And today, North Korea is the only country in the world where children can be sent to a political prison camp and where children can spend their entire lives in these camps. These camps established by Kim Il-sung when he came to power are where millions of North Koreans have been killed. At this very moment, hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children are suffering in these camps where they are worked to death in horrendous conditions. North Korea is the only country in modern history to have faced massive starvation while in the absence of war. At least three million North Koreans have died of starvation since the famine. That has never happened in modern history in a so-called industrialized nation to have millions of its citizens starve to death. This starvation is caused by the regime's agricultural policies, their withholding of food aid when the international community tries to help, and basically the Kim regime using food as a weapon against its own people. Lee Min Bok was a North Korean agricultural specialist who traveled the country studying agricultural output. He saw that private farms totally outperformed the collective farms and realized starvation could be averted if adjustments were made in the policies of the Kim dictatorship. After turning in his report, he was warned to flee the country because he was about to be sent to a political prison camp because he questioned the dictator's policies. When North Korea recently was gripped with famine, there was enough humanitarian aid sent to North Korea by the international community to ensure no one would starve. Yet the re regime intentionally allowed millions of its citizens to starve <laughs> using international food aid as a weapon. Part of the Kim regime's method of control is the Sung Bong classification system. This system ranks every North Korean based on their loyalty to the regime. This classification system determines the food you will receive, the school you may attend, the type of employment you may pursue, even where you will live. The highest people on that classification system are the elites. The elites are considered the most loyal to the regime and thus are the only ones allowed to live in Pyongyang, the capital city, and have all the top positions in government and throughout North Korea. Some areas of North Korea that were determined not to be loyal to the regime were completely cut off from food aid, which led to another crisis for North Koreans starting in the 1990s, refugees. Starvation led North Koreans to cross the border into China to try to find food for their families. In the early days of the famine, the regime, through its government propaganda, tried to warn the North Korean people not to go to China, explaining that China was experiencing a civil war. North Koreans were faced with a terrible choice. Starve to death with their families or take their chances in China. One North Korean doctor, Dr. Kim Jae-un, tells the story of crossing the border in 1999. She was one of the elites, a respected and hardworking doctor who was devoted to the regime. She had started out as a pediatrician, but she could no longer bear treating the starving children who were wasting away in her family. After her father died of starvation, and facing starvation herself, she crossed the border to China. What she discovered there shocked her. One of the first things she saw was a farmhouse with a bowl of rice 
with meat just sitting on the ground outside the door. She was shocked when she realized it was food for a dog. She concluded, dogs in China eat better than doctors in North Korea. These first refugees who crossed the border in the 1990s came back with such stories. China had regular electricity, cars, prosperity, but most importantly, food. So word of mouth spread and soon hundreds of thousands of North Koreans were crossing the border into China. This led to more harm for the people of North Korea due to how China decided to treat the North Korean refugees. Instead of abiding by its UN international treaty obligations, China determined the starving men, women, and children of North Korea were economic migrants, ignoring that they were risking their lives when they crossed that border. Another unique aspect about North Korea, the North Korean refugees who have fled North Korea are the only refugees in the world who have a place to go for immediately to be resettled. But they are being hunted down and sent back to North Korea. Think of this for just a moment. We have a refugee crisis right now, and in Europe, there is much debate over how to help the refugees fleeing ISIS and war in the Middle East and North Africa. Where can the refugees be safely resettled? This is always a great problem when there are refugees. But North Koreans are unlike any refugees in the, refugees in the world because they do have a place to go for immediate resettlement. They are citizens of South Korea under the South Korean Constitution. Yet the government of China refuses to allow them safe passage to South Korea and the many other countries that are willing to accept them. Instead, North Korean refugees are hunted down and forced back to, by the Chinese authorities to North Korea to face certain torture, certain imprisonment, and even execution for fleeing starvation. Why such treatment in North Korea? Because as I mentioned before, North Koreans do not have the right to travel. Leaving the country without permission is considered a crime punishable by death. So they face more suffering when they are forced back by the Chinese authorities. You may know that China has a one-child policy that has led to a shortage of women in China. So you have a country with a shortage of women, women in China, and a country where women are trying to feed their starving families, North Korea, which has created a horrific situation. As a result of China's cruel repatriation policy, North Korean refugees are extremely vulnerable, and over 80% of North Korean females are exploited by human traffickers. <coughs> Most North Korean females who cross the China-North Korea border end up being sold to Chinese men as wives, forced into prostitution and internet pornography. I've had the honor of, of giving many brave North Korean women the opportunity to testify for the United States Congress about this suffering. Many have been sold multiple times and cruelly treated by their so-called husbands. Because Mrs. Bong Lee Soon's husband had starved to death during the famine, she decided to save the rest of her family by going to China. She said, I thought I would be able to feed my children once I got to China, but what was really waiting for us was the possibility of arrest and, and forced returned to North Korea by the Chinese police. Just as I was ready to do anything that would guarantee my children's safety, a Chinese trafficker appeared and began to threaten me using my children's vulnerability. In the end, I was sold for $586. The Chinese brokers called us North Korean women pigs. The markets for North Korean females are functioning today. And in fact, the China-North Korea border is even more dangerous than ever before. Where else in the world does a government turn its back on the buying and selling of its own citizens as the North Korean regime works with China to terrorize its own citizens and create this vulnerability? In addition to the suffering of North Korean women, it's estimated that there are also tens of thousands of North Korean children starving in China, and living in abandoned buildings, and eating out of trash cans. I want to show you this, the power, this next PowerPoint number two. How, how many of you uh, recognize uh, this, this young lady? I'm going to just show you this photo. <coughs> it's number two. Sorry. Yeah. But that's it. Yeah. I think we can just this. Hold on. If you just click that. 
She's become an international hero and has spoken at the United Nations. And it's and I'm so glad that she has gotten that attention for this issue. This the third one is that one? No. Ah, yes. Okay. This photo became very, very famous in the United States. I'm assuming it became very famous here because it's a young three-year-old boy that washed up uh, on the beach trying to be a Syrian refugee. Many people know about. The refugee crisis for the Syrians because of that photo. It really, it really uh, shocked people to act, and finally people are acting. But this next number three, I feel certain that none of you know about her. This is a girl who escaped from North Korea at the same age as Malayla. And just like that Syrian family, she was trying to survive. Her name is No Ye Ji, and she was the youngest of a group of nine children who escaped successfully from North Korea. She had been starving to death in North Korea and was sold to a Chinese farmer to work as a slave laborer. The hardship on the farm was so unbearable, she fled, but she was sold again. She said, I'm only 14 years old, but life is too hard for me to bear. Fortunately, she was rescued by a South Korean missionary and his wife who helped her escape with eight other children who all wanted to live in South Korea. They made it all the way to Laos. But on the day that she thought she was leaving for South Korea, which is the picture down here, when she finally got to Laos, she thought she was going to South Korea. On that day, the Laotian government, working with the Chinese government and the North Korean regime, forced her back to North Korea. Can you imagine three governments conspiring together to force a 14-year-old back to hell in North Korea on the very day she thought she was getting her freedom in South Korea? We're shocked at a 14-year-old being shot in Pakistan like Malayla. We're shocked when a small refugee boy of only three washes up on a beach. But where is the shock? for the atrocities that are being committed against the Korean people right now, at this moment, every day. We should also be shocked at what is happening to the North Korean refugees. Like another 14-year-old girl, the daughter of Ko Mei Hwang, a North Korean mother who tried to reach South Korea but was separated from her daughter. When her daughter was repatriated back to North Korea, a border guard beat her to death. That is what is occurring on the North Korea-China border today. Now, personally, I've been making the case that North Korea is the worst human rights tragedy in the world today for nearly two decades. And in fact, the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights and the People's Republic of Korea concluded the same thing in February 2014, stating that the gravity, scale, and nature of these violations reveal a state that does not have any parallel in the contemporary world. The COI concluded that the Kim regime in North Korea was committing unspeakable atrocities and crimes against humanity, including extermination, murder, enslavement, torture, imprisonment, rape, forced abortions, and other sexual violence, persecution of political, religious, race, and gender groups, the forcible transfer of populations, the enforced disappearance of persons, and the inhumane act of knowingly causing a long starvation. <clears throat> After World War II, when the full scale of the atrocities committed by Nazi Germany against the Jewish people was realized, the international community vowed never again would the world stand by and allow this type of cruelty to occur again. Yet, if you are North Korean, those words never again ring hollow because it is happening again and we're allowing it to continue. Now, in the face of all this, I do have great hope today. Because Kim Jong-un's North Korea 
is not the North Korea of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il because there have been dramatic changes there. For starters, there has been an information explosion in North Korea as a result of the famine, forcing people to cross the border. Inform the famine forcing people across the border. Information began flowing in and out of North Korea that was unprecedented. Part of the ability of, North Korea of the North Korean regime to remain in power is the ability to isolate and literally brainwash its citizens. They are taught from childhood to believe they live in a great paradise, that South Korea is way behind them economically and is occupied by the cruel Yankee imperialist wolves, also known as Americans, who they are raised to hate. They do not know that Americans and the international community have sent them billions of food and humanitarian aid, and that we are deeply concerned about their suffering. In fact, this is an issue that unites the right and the left in America. Both current US President Barack Obama and former President George Bush have spoken out eloquently of their concern for the suffering in North Korea. North Koreans may not know this yet, but they are absolutely learning a lot about South Korea and the outside world through the abundance of South Korean soap operas and Western films that have illegally flowed into North Korea. More and more North Koreans are listening to foreign radio broadcasts, watching South Korean soap operas and Western films. They now know their regime has been lying to them about South Korea and the rest of the world. Defectors have told me that the Western film Titanic became so widely watched in North Korea that the regime felt compelled to respond. As you probably know in the story, a man gives up his life to save the woman he loves. This concept, to value another's life, gets back to that worldwide conflict that we're facing. It is something revolutionary for North Koreans as North Koreans are literally slaves to the dictatorship. They owe their undying allegiance to Kim Jong-un. Defectors who watched that movie, like Park young me saw something that was foreign to them. The concept of sacrificing for another out of love. They saw humanity. The regime had to respond to this. And through their propaganda, informed the North Korean people that the movie Titanic wasn't so much a love story, but was a depiction of the failure of capitalism because the great ship Titanic, symbolizing capitalism, sunk on the same day as Kim Il Sung's birthday, April 15, 1912. It is estimated that today that at least 60% of North Koreans are getting information beyond the regime's propaganda. The ability to cut the North Korean people off from the rest of the world is no longer possible. And the regime is no longer able to keep North Koreans literally in the dark. Over half a century of propaganda, which convinced the North Korean people that they were the most advanced nation and lived in a wonderful paradise, has totally unraveled as so much information is getting into North Korea. An another major method of control has also disappeared, the public distribution system which is the way the regime distributed food and material goods based on the Songbong classification system. For example, elites may have access to rice, while the less loyal may have gotten corn. The same applied to material goods. The system made the entire population entirely dependent on the regime for survival, but the system broke down completely in the 1990s, which triggered the massive starvation. However, the resiliency of the North Korean people led them to start trading and selling among themselves, leading to an explosion of private markets throughout North Korea to such an extent that the majority of the population now survives on its own through these markets. In other words, capitalism is thriving in North Korea, and through their own determination, North Koreans have avoided more starvation. Attempt after attempt by the regime to shut down and then to try to control these markets rep repeatedly failed. That is why in December 2009, the regime tried to shut down a growing middle class by a currency devaluation, by issuing new currency and essentially wiping out everyone's savings. The purpose of this action was an attempt by the regime to reassert its control, but it failed. 
the overwhelming hostile reaction to the currency devaluation by the North Korean people led to the regime doing something it had never done in its brutal, repressive, over 60 year history. It apologized. Now the regime has accepted the existence of well over 200 markets, and those are just the ones in regular operation that we can see by satellite. The famine not only led to these private markets, but it also led to the people no longer trusting the regime. Defectors tell us that in the past it was every citizen's strong desire to become a member of the Korean Workers' Party, which was the path to success in North Korea. But now their goals have changed. Their desire now is to survive by making money and providing for their families. Something else has happened that has dramatically changed the situation, and that is eyewitnesses. There is nothing that the regime fears more than those who have escaped. It is why they go to such great lengths to silence the voices of the defectors, stopping them from escaping through China, and going so far as to send assassins to kill the most outspoken defectors in South Korea. <coughs> While the world has been slow to acknowledge the everyday horrors the North Korean people face, we now have 27,000 eyewitnesses who have escaped from North Korea to testify about the horrific conditions. Many are communicating regularly with their family members, providing another source of information about the outside world. Now you have a population that is increasingly getting information from the outside world and is no longer dependent on the, and is no longer dependent on the regime to survive. So what should we be doing to address the North Korea human rights crisis? I will focus on seven ways that individuals, organizations, and governments can help. Number one, pressure China on the refugees and their support for the D DPRK. We need to save the lives of those in immediate danger by rescuing refugees and pressuring the government of China to end its horrific treatment of innocent men, women, and children. Today, the situation facing refugees is worse than ever before because Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping have escalated an already brutal crackdown for those trying to escape. While we've gained greatly in the recognition of the severe human rights violations in North Korea, we have absolutely lost ground on the North Korean refugee issue due to the ongoing collaboration between China and North Korea. Individuals should join us on, for our worldwide action on September 24th, Save North Korean Refugees Day. For those cities that have Chinese embassies and consulates, we are simply asking for a letter of appeal to be delivered, calling on China to abide by its international treaty obligations and stop forcefully sending North Korean refugees back to North Korea. The appeal includes the letter Justice Michael Kirby sent to the PRC outlining the ways in which China, Chinese authorities are complicit in North Korea's crimes against humanity. We also have Solidarity Cities joining where folks are gathering to see films like Crossing, an award-winning movie that was South Korea's entry to the Academy Awards. Thanks to Teresa Ost, we have a version with Spanish subtitles. This is a wonderful film about a North Korean family and a father's attempts to rescue his son during the famine. We need governments to encourage China to work with South Korea to resolve the North Korea issue. We know that the people of China support us on this. They know the future is with South Korea, not North Korea. Even Chinese leaders and writers have expressed this view. Chinese General Wang wrote in the Global Times in December 2014 that China had cleaned up the DPRK mess too many times and that collapse is just a matter of time. Several years ago, Deng Yuen then editor of the Study Times, the journal of the Central Party School of the Communist Party of China, wrote that China should give up on Pyongyang and press for the reunification of the Korean Peninsula. Now, he lost his editorship, but his words resonated. More recently, he wrote, North Korea will ultimately fail no matter how much money you throw at it, it, it and it is in the process of collapse. These leaders realized the reality of the failed state of North Korea. In addition, South Korean culture is very, very popular in 
and China, and the countries enjoy a robust trade relationship, governments need to support South Korea on this issue and join in pressuring China to stop repatriating refugees and to stop being complicit in North Korea's crimes against humanity by literally bailing out the Kim regime with their financial support. Second, we must never again sideline human rights atrocities and human rights concerns for the failed belief that North Korea will ever give up its nuclear weapons. I've been saying this for nearly two decades. The regime in North Korea never intended nor will it ever give up on its nuclear program. Hwang jan yak the highest ranking defector and author of Juche, warned us repeatedly after he defected in 1997 when he thought the regime was going to collapse. North Korea uses negotiations to extract concessions. It will never give up its nuclear program. Human rights must be the issue. During all these years of talks, the four-party talks, the agreed framework, the sunshine policy, the engagement policy, and the six-party talks, millions of North Koreans have died. It's important to point out that North Korea is not only committing crimes against humanity, against its own people, but it is also actively involved in proliferating weapons of mass destruction in Syria, Iraq, and other countries, is involved in drug trafficking and counterfeiting, and is sending out its own citizens as slave laborers in countries all over the world. We must focus our attention on the suffering of the North Korean people and make that our highest priority. Third, <coughs> third we must never again fund this regime and ensure that any aid is monitored to the point of consumption. I'm a, I'm a big advocate of food aid, but aid must be monitored to the point of consumption to ensure that it gets to its intended recipients. Otherwise, this regime will divert, its, divert the aid for its own use and empowerment. During the famine, highly respected groups like Action Against Hunger and Doctors Without Borders left North Korea in protest when they realized their aid was being diverted. While his people faced massive starvation, Kim Jong-il continued to spend millions on his nuclear program in his own lavish lifestyle. And today, his son is continuing this reckless and cruel policy. Today, most North Koreans that are not part of the regime's elite face chronic hunger and malnourishment while Kim Jong-un diverts billions to develop nuclear weapons and threatens South Korea and destabilizes the region. The cost of just one rocket launch is roughly $850 million, enough money to feed 19 million North Koreans for an entire year. Fourth, we must empower the North Korean defectors and support their efforts. The terrible fear the regime had about the movie The Interview shows how much their fear of the flow of information. It led to their hacking of Sony. There is no more powerful weapon that we have to reach the people of North Korea than the truth told by those who escaped, the North Korean people themselves. I'm very proud that we actively support the broadcast of Free North Korea Radio, the most popular single program to broadcast to North Korea. Founded by Kim Sung Min, FNKR is a Seoul-based radio station entirely staffed by North Korean defectors. Kim was a captain in the North Korean army who was being taken by train to Pyongyang to be publicly executed for trying to flee North Korea. He jumped from that moving train and he escaped again to China, but he's never forgotten those he left behind and started Free North Korea Radio. Every day, he is broadcasting hope and truth to the people of North Korea. In fact, we're planning on broadcasting a Catholic Mass in October so that North Koreans will understand about the Christian faith. We did this over Easter weekend as well. We are also actively involved with several groups getting information into North Korea through the border and also through balloon launches. These defector NGOs are sending information on leaflets, USBs, and flash drives, and are also sending in shortwave radios and even money. One year, we sent in hundreds of thousands of leaflets that, that included excerpts from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights explaining that all North Koreans had these rights. 
It's also important to reach out to the military in North Korea. And there is an organization composed of North Korean defectors who served in the military, the North Korea People's Liberation Front. We know that the only time there was organized opposition against the regime came from the military. So this is a vital outreach. We need to convince those in, North Korea, in the North Korean military that their true enemy is this regime, as the back-to-back -back Kim dictatorships have killed more North Koreans than were killed during the Korean War. Fifth, we must address the one missing ingredient in this fight for human rights in North Korea, internal opposition. The fact is that there is no one inside North Korea pressing for change internally, which underscores just how repressive the Kim Jong-un regime is. This is the last stronghold of the regime, the only missing ingredient for change, internal opposition. Right now, the elites have absolutely no incentive to oppose Kim Jong-un because their entire lives are wrapped up in his success. We must address the elites by reaching out to them, to reaching out to them through the elites that have escaped. We must let them know they will have a stake in the future when Kim is gone. Several groups have formed in South Korea, composed of the elites who are able to communicate information back to North Korea. They just need support. Sixth, the United States needs to pass the North Korea Sanctions Enforcement Bill so that we can cut off the flow of money of the regime that buys the loyalty of the elites who keep that regime functioning. Seventh and finally, South Korea needs to start naming names and start a legal process for holding the regime accountable. I know that the COI has recommended that the North Korea regime be referred to the International Criminal Court for its crimes. But I also strongly believe that the South Korea National Human Rights Commission should publicize the, name, the names of those who have committed these human rights violations. They could begin with their own North Korea human rights infringement report that publicized 834 cases several years ago. I have long recommended that South Korea name names, but also establish a tribunal or some kind of legal process to hold those in the regime accountable for their crimes. South Korea could immediately convene a tribunal of respected judges to begin the prosecution of those in the regime that are responsible for the political prison camps, for the attacks on South Korea's military and civilians, for the misappropriation of food aid and other atrocities. When that 14-year-old daughter of Ko Mei Hwa was beaten to death for simply trying to survive, I thought, how can you stop such cruelty? You can let that border guard know we know who you are, and you will be held accountable. In closing, I want to show you two more pictures. This would be number five. First, this is a cartoon the North Koreans made attacking our work several years ago. I do not know why they chose a kangaroo to symbolize me, but do you see, you can see what's in my pouch. Through this attack, you can see what the regime fears most. Note the microphone symbolizing broadcasting. They fear Free North Korea Radio's powerful message. It is targeted for jamming more than any other radio station. And even the Chinese now are trying to block the jamming of Free North Korea Radio. Note the leaflets. These leaflets sent in via balloon launches are another source of fear because they also communicate information to the North Koreans. We know so many defectors who have read the leaflets, especially the military, who are instructed to scoop them up and destroy them. You will also see in this cartoon what appears to be a, a red dot. It's on the, the My Baby Kangaroo. There's a red dot symbolizing Japan. North Korea fears any close alliance between South Korea and Japan and works closely to try to cause tension between these two democratic nations. Finally, the symbol here in this cartoon for which I'm most proud is the cross symbolizing our Christian faith. We know that the Kim regime's greatest fear is Christianity. Christianity is a greater threat to the regime than South Korea, America, or even capitalism. 
Why? Because of what I stated in the beginning of this talk. The DPRK regime is the complete antithesis of a faith that values each and every human life. A faith that teaches about sacrificial love, redemption, and freedom. This is a regime that disdains human life, condemns, and enslaves. Finally, I want to share a story with you about a North Korean defector. This last photo. This is uh, Kim Oak Gum. Kim Oak Gum has come to represent to me the hope that we have for North Korea. I hosted her in Washington, D.C. and at the United Nations a few years ago. This is her picture with my son giving his thumbs up. Because Oak Gum's family was starving, she, like so many North Korean mothers, had gone to China to try to get food. But she was caught and repatriated back to North Korea. She was tortured and then sent to a political prison camp for the crime of trying to feed her family. She told me that she felt fortunate because she was sent to a political prison camp where she worked outside as a slave laborer. So she had access to plants and bugs. I remember her showing me how she forced herself to eat grasshoppers because they were full of protein. And she was so determined to survive that horrible ordeal so that she could be reunited with her 10-year-old son. When she was finally released from prison, she returned home only to find that her son had died of starvation. Her husband had divorced her while she was in the political prison camp. With no reason to stay in North Korea, she fled to China again, only to be caught and sent to a Chinese detention center. While in the detention center, she was met by another mother who was crying over the welfare of her daughter. She had left back in North Korea, as she had come to China to try to get food for her daughter, but was caught by the Chinese police. Mrs. Kim knew exactly what this woman was experiencing, so she helped her escape from that detention center. As a result, Mrs. Kim was brutally beaten to the point that she nearly became paralyzed. All North Korean defectors have a similar story. But Mrs. Kim's story illustrates something very powerful about this battle. I described it, the battle I described at the beginning of this lecture. Even though she was raised in North Korea to be a slave to that <clears throat> dictatorship, Mrs. Kim felt in her own heart this great compassion for someone who suffered. She could not be stripped of her human dignity. Now, I happen to be a follower of Jesus Christ, so by the very nature of my belief is that every human life has value. But Mrs. Kim grew up enslaved to the Kim dictatorship and knew none of these values. In fact, Mrs. Kim suffered greatly. Through her own suffering, she put her own life in danger to save another. Not because she was a follower of Jesus Christ like me, but because she felt in her heart the pain of another mother and compassion and she took action. She was beaten for this heroic kind, act of kindness and love. But she escaped again. She has triumphed over the evil of the North Korean regime to live in freedom in South Korea. Now she helps other North Koreans and has become a Christian and a leader in her church. To me, she represents the indomitable spirit of humanity. She gives me hope that soon all North Koreans will live as free people. And I hope that all of you will join us in this cause and get involved with our North Korean Freedom Coalition and visit our website for the refugees. Thank you. Muchas gracias.